I'm very pleased to introduce this session, What You Should Know About High Stakes Cheating in Your Schools. We're pleased to be joined by Mike Stetter, who spent 10 years, now he has his own education security consulting company, but spent uh, 10 years with the Delaware Department of Education, three years as the State Assessment Director. Also presenting today is John Freemer, Caveat's President of our Consulting Services Group. Uh, before I turn things over to them, I want to thank all the members of, uh, or all the school district folks from Mississippi. We've got a huge contingent and want to give uh, a hats off. Thanks for participating today. We hope to share some valuable information with you. So now, without further ado, let me say, Mike and John, it's all yours. Great. Can we have the next slide? Delighted to have so many school staff on this call, which is the focus of the call. My wife was an eighth grade teacher in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and my youngest daughter teaches fifth grade in San Jose, California. So uh, we're kind of an education family. I work my whole life in various uh, aspects of education. We have four main areas that we're going to cover today, and Mike and I will share them. Uh, the test security situation uh, around the country, the particular challenges we see that a school district leader faces, our top 10 things that you can do to strengthen test security, and then a suggestion we have a particular strategy that you can take to uh, uh, try to gain the upper hand in a really important situation. So the next slide. So our first area, what we call the test security situation, we're going to look at who cheats, how many of them are there, and how often do they cheat. Next slide. We've got a poll for you to try to get a fix on how often you're dealing with messages coming in. So that should go up. Yeah, John, I've launched that poll. The question is, were you notified of test irregularities in your district testing program during the school year? So we'll give folks uh, a chance to respond. I like to keep these sessions interactive, so <clears throat> If you can, just click on something. We'll keep it open for about 30 seconds or so. And we've got a majority of folks have responded. I'll leave it open for just another second. And we'll close it, share the results. John, about 58% of the folks have said, yeah, they have had a situation. 30%, 29% haven't, and 13 aren't quite sure. And recognizing, of course, that the main testing, the NCLB testing, in many cases is going on right now. So they may not yet have been notified, but I bet many of them will be. So let's move on into our test security situation content slides. And I'm just going to touch on some of the many that we've noticed. Um, Joseph and, uh, Institute uh, survey, college students, 2010, 95% admitted to cheating in high school. 51% believe they must cheat to get ahead. And in spite of those two uh, statistics, 90% were pleased with their own morality. Uh, tough dealing with that crowd. Uh, next slide. This is contrasting adults over 50 and youth under 17. Do you believe cheating is necessary? 50% of kids, 10% of over 50s, okay to deceive your boss. 31% under 17 thinks it's all okay, only 8% over 50. 49% uh, it's okay to keep incorrect change if you get it. If you're a kid, not not if you're over 50, where you understand who has to pay that short, and it's okay to lie to your spouse. They're under 17 already. 45% of them think it's okay, but 22% of us who've lived beyond 50 know what a stupid idea that is. 
it, it really goes back, I think it's Socrates, that the younger generation really in some ways is going to the dogs, at least on this issue. Uh, next slide. Here are the uh, people being uh, surveyed are educators, teachers primarily. 29% uh, of them felt pressure to cheat on standardized tests, 34% felt pressure to change scores, and 21% of them said that they knew educators that had changed scores. And speak, you always get larger numbers if you ask people what someone else did than if you ask what they did. But even in this situation, anonymous, 8% admitted to changing student scores. So it's not like it's a minor issue. Uh, next slide. And we're going to just show a few of the media uh, stories about uh, cheating in the news, some of which uh, I'm afraid you're probably quite familiar with. First, DC schools, uh, so, uh, more than 100 schools displaying suspicious anti cheat erasers. That's uh, from USA Today. It's been picked up again recently, another bunch of stories. And uh, at the time that story was written, there were two uh, teachers that had been forced to resign. Uh, next slide. This is Houston, and for a while, Houston and, and Texas in general, Houston and Dallas were the epicenters of media stories. That shifted east to Atlanta and D.C. and Philadelphia. But Houston Independent School District, there were two elementary school teachers that were detected. Uh, for changing uh, student answers on state tests. Uh, next slide. This is some of the recent coverage of the Atlanta Public Schools. 179 educators in 58 schools, uh, 41 resignations in retirement, and then spectacularly, and uh, as far as I can tell, uh, there's no precedent for this, a huge number indicted by the grand jury, including virtually the entire leadership of the system, uh, including the superintendent and her deputies. Uh, it's amazing. I just heard a presentation on it in the last week by the, the head of that task force, uh, Robert Wilson from Atlanta, and uh, it's, uh, it sounds like they're just absolutely convinced at the uh, county level, the, the, uh, the litigators, that there's no possible way things could occur at that level without the superintendent knowing. I have a little trouble with that because superintendent's jobs are so complicated that they would know everything. It strikes me as a little strange, but this is a compelling case. It's so widespread, so unlike just about any other case. And then uh, the next slide. Uh, They've done, the Atlanta General Constitution has done probably the most stories. Uh, be careful if you get contacts for them because they, they really like to write stories about cheating. And you might think you're passing along in, innocent information, but if, you're, if you have anomalous results and those with statistical backgrounds, things that only occur 1% of the time will occur 1% in, in, with no uh, unusual uh, bad behavior occurring, but that's not always recognized when the stories are written. Uh, but the Atlanta Journal Constitution is one of the places that's made the point that this is not a single state problem. This looks to be a state uh, by state, a national problem. And I heard someone at the National Council on Measurement and Education last week say that if you're a state and you want to know, should I do a, a, a study to see if I have cheating in my state, don't waste your money. You do have cheating in your state, and you do have cheating in any large district. The question is how much and how much of a problem. Uh, then next slide. There are a number of quotes about this. I'm, this one is uh, from uh, Secretary Duncan, but the pressure or some of the pressure on this goes to school district administrators. Uh, Secretary Duncan doesn't want to uh, blame the No Child Left Beyond law, although a lot of ed researchers and other writers do. He, he wants school leaders to, to uh, 
be the ones that take the blame, not that you don't have enough on your plate. But uh, that means all of us have to pay more attention and prove to the public school boards and others that we're on top of this case. I think, uh, Steve, we have another poll. We do indeed. I'm going to launch it now, John. This question is, does your district provide financial rewards for meeting test performance targets? We've just opened up the polls. We've got quite a bit of active voting going on. I'll leave it open for another 20 seconds or so. I'd like to get a majority of the participants to respond. And another couple of seconds, we had 75% or so of our attendees respond. And John, look at that, the vast majority do not. But there is about 18% that do have some sort of incentive. And it, uh, it seems to be clear, we, we try to study these reports very carefully, that there may be a lot of very fine reasons to have financial rewards. In some cases, it's written into uh, regulations and uh, le legislation that you at the school level can't control. But if you have it, you do uh, open up yet another reason why some will misbehave. And there are lots of other reasons anyway. The fact that we're going to be using or are using student scores and teacher evaluation being one of them. So I think we're ready to turn over now to Mike to a, in a new area. Thanks, John and Steve. Um, good afternoon or good morning to everybody, depending on your time zone. Um, uh, John mentioned his background and family connections to education. Prior to joining Delaware Department of Education uh, for uh, 10 wonderful years in curriculum assessment, uh, I had over 20 years of uh, direct experience in schools as a science teacher, a building principal, a school psychologist, and district assessment director. So many of the comments that I want to share with you this afternoon come out of that direct experience. Um, in contrast, direct contrast, the highly controlled test situations that we often find with professional licensure exams or medical school, law school entry, schools present some unique challenges in terms of test security and test administration. Many of these that I'm going to mention to you will not come as any surprise, but I've grouped them in four areas here. Under potential conflicts of interest, we need to recognize that when we ask teachers to be proctors for high stakes examinations, we're also uh, bringing into play the, the possibility that uh, in many states there is teacher accountability and some compensatory bonuses attached to score gains for their students. We've also got school accountability tied to uh, score movement over time. And for those schools who have found themselves under school improvement, the importance of raising student test scores is paramount to the reputation and, in many cases, their ability to attract families to their school. Under the, the heading of non-standardized environment, we notice that we, uh, especially with uh, larger size schools, uh, find teachers making do uh, with compromised test situations classrooms in which, uh, despite the uh, requests, uh, we may, uh, as we visit those classrooms, find that there are word walls, other cues, uh, students sitting in close proximity to each other, uh, teachers who are not always actively monitoring the test situation, and in some cases, students finding it entirely possible to share answers with other students, uh, pull out a cell phone and make a call out uh, side of the room, or in other ways, uh, compromise the test situation. We have had instances where schools take it upon themselves to cluster small groups of students. Um, uh, for example, uh, students who they know are uh, were good test takers, and in that small group they may assign a youngster who they know to have a history of being distractible or poorly motivated for testing in the hopes that the good student models will influence that poor uh, performing student to do better. We also might find, uh, as you have seen in the past, that schools may take license to change the nature of the length of the test session and chunk smaller sessions, 
so that they avoid student fatigue and some of the behaviors that happen when a test session runs uh, longer than perhaps 45 to 60 minutes. The examinee familiarity piece is one that's a classic. We, we find that teachers, uh, just as our other uh, helping professions, uh, very eager to uh, advocate for their students and often to uh, identify with their success or failure. Uh, this can lead to, in some cases, if we're not careful to draw the line, uh, teacher assistance to students when they are convinced that the student otherwise would know the answer but because it's a test situation, the youngster is just not thinking clearly. So there might be an attempt to help, or after the session, perhaps some pressure that the teacher feels to uh, improve the answers, either on a paper pencil test or by re-entering the computer-based testing. Um, this, I think, fits under the heading of the halo effect that very often we, we find when, when teachers have invested so much time with a particular student. There are um, shortcuts and transporting and storing test materials are part of these shortcuts. In uh, larger schools where you've got long hallways and perhaps limited storage space for secure test materials, there can be trade-offs in terms of what the building test coordinator uh, really does want to uphold as secure and what the teachers are willing to do simply because they want the test materials there at the beginning of the day. So we can often find the circumstance where test materials are compromised because they're in unlocked cabinets or on tabletops waiting for pickup. Um, we can find that uh, in the normal course of events in the day, uh, things like uh, an unexpected uh, fire alarm, a crash of the computer system, perhaps uh, a large uh, number of, of teachers absent due to illness, uh, really forces the, the building test coordinator and the district test director to come up with accommodated test sessions which are uh, far off of the ideal. Uh, finally, uh, if, if you and your district are not careful, you may find that after the test window has closed, uh, you have quite a difficult time retrieving secure test materials that need to be returned to the vendor or destroyed. Um, I've had the direct experience of having to investigate situations where teachers, when they were pressed as to where were the secure booklets or uh, other materials, would, would comment, oh, I thought I was allowed to keep those. Can we have the next slide? Given these unique challenges uh, of conducting high-stakes assessment in the schools, uh, I want to turn our attention to the roles played by the superintendent, the district assessment uh, director or coordinator, and the school test coordinators at each of the schools in, in terms of what they can do before, during, and after the test window. In the next few slides, I'm going to touch on some of the specifics, but I also would like you to uh, check into the um, um, test security matrix that we've posted to the website and that we'll be certain to send out with uh, the um, information about this webinar afterwards that gives much more detail. Uh, next slide, Rochelle. Um, this is just a screenshot of what, what the matrix looks like. So we've got the web link up here where this uh, document is located. So please, when you have an opportunity after the webinar, uh, download this. I, I've tried to design it with an eye toward it being easily reproduced and shared with uh, other members of your district. Next slide. The way we've got this set up, uh, I did want to uh, emphasize the point that it is not simply during the test window where a, a comprehensive test security approach is needed. We've got uh, threats that can occur on an ongoing basis outside of the test window, and there are uh, activities that are, can be easily compromised leading up to the first day of testing and immediately after the test window concludes. So let's take a look at some of these threats. Next slide. From the school district uh, superintendent's uh, uh, standpoint, I think we need to appreciate that district leaders set the tone for overall administration of all phases of the district assessment program, including state as well as local assessments, such as end of course exams. Assessment of students should be seen as an essential aspect of instruction, especially as it informs learning goals and activities and the district's strategic plan. Positive highly visible and well-organized interaction by the superintendent 
with test proctors, the building assessment coordinators, student groups, the local teacher association, and the community serve the district well by signaling the importance and the overall monitoring of a sound testing program. All local stakeholders should be reassured by these activities, especially if they're visible, if they're mentioned in the newsletter, if there is um, uh, items on the school board agenda. Uh, potential mischief makers, on the ha other hand, I think would be put on alert that their efforts to subvert the process will quickly be brought to light. Uh, this can apply to students or to uh, staff members within the district community. Prompt investigation of suspected test irregularities will further reinforce this positive stance. Next slide. Let's turn our attention now to the district assessment uh, director. Having served in this capacity and having worked with many of the uh, district assessment uh, directors in Delaware in my capacity with the State Department, I know that this is an, uh, a thankless job. So uh, to my colleagues out there, I still uh, uh, owe you quite a bit of support for all that you do. The district assessment director should be empowered by the superintendent to oversee three critical functions in a well-conceived, secure district assessment program. First, organize the training program for all staff directly involved as building test coordinators, the test proctors, or those who may assist with the management of secure test materials or computer access. This can be the guidance counselor. This can be other folks pressed into service for small group accommodated test sessions. Uh, secondly, um, you recognize how important it is to monitor all schools for compliance with the district and state test security plan, including management of secure test materials and proper administration procedures. Uh, making unannounced visits to schools, as you know their test schedule, and circulating around often will allow you to send a clear message that folks are not invisible to you during this test program. Thirdly, uh, if you do not have a test security plan in your district or the test security plan is simply something in your head that you try to, to carry out, I'd advise you to uh, make this a more formal document that can be shared and referenced. Update, update the plan as you need to so that the training, secure test access, student confidentiality, and follow-up procedures on suspected test irregularities are clearly delineated. This includes ongoing communications with the state assessment director and local building test coordinators throughout the year regarding key updates or changes. Next slide. When we talk about uh, the districts and the buildings, I, the, uh, uh, I think the person that is uh, in the uh, forward trenches here is the building test coordinator. They serve as the link pin, trying to communicate changes, the do's and, and uh, not do's in the test situation. And they're typically the first to uh, hear of or observe something that uh, could construe a test irregularity. Um, here are some examples of things that the building test coordinators have shared with uh, me over the years. Uh, this, these all sound like harmless situations until you think of the impact on the integrity of the test program. A grade level team at a school agrees to log in all students for the day under the first teacher to visit the computer lab in the morning, making it impossible to determine how long specific classroom groups were in the lab or if they returned more than once to the lab. Another situation. Principal emails all teachers with the day's test schedule and invites them to stop by the lab during their planning period to observe testing. One teacher takes advantage of this invitation and decides to use the opportunity to copy test questions, later distributed by email to other colleagues who didn't have time to visit the lab. We also heard about this situation recently. A new teacher who missed the proctor training decides to write down all the test questions and answer choices of the computer-based math test for his students, later explaining to the district assessment coordinator that it was simply to help him adjust his instruction to the tested content. Now, if he had attended the proctor training, he would have been informed in no uncertain terms that any copying of test materials was inappropriate and not allowed. Finally, this example, several teachers provide test day accommodations such as reading the test item allowed for IEP or ELL students when this accommodation is not something that they do receive in the regular classroom. 
So in, in a misguided attempt to make sure that the test situation was gathering this student's optimal effort, we wind up finding somebody asking for accommodations that they don't normally receive in instruction. In each of these cases, the building test coordinator was the first to report up the chain of, of command that these irregularities needed to be followed up. Uh, at this point, Steve, I think we have the third of our polls coming up. That's right, Mike. We sure do. Thanks for that great content. Um, I'm going to launch this poll, which is, does your district have formal test security guidelines posted on your district website or in hard copy? So we'll give folks a chance to react. And uh, while people are responding, I was remiss in not mentioning that there is an ability for you to type questions. We will have Q&A at the end of our time today. But uh, along the way, if you've got a question for Mike and John, go ahead and post it, and we'll see if we can uh, address it during the session before the q and I've got 80% who have voted. I'm going to close this. And I'll share it. Look at that. 81% do have these things posted and available. 12% don't, and 7 are not quite sure. Any surprise there for you, Mike? Uh, pleasantly surprised. I, I'm delighted. I, I think that uh, uh, district assessment leaders and their superintendents have really grasped the importance of making sure that the test results coming out of their student assessment program uh, have all the confidence needed in order for them to be applied and shared with the community. So this is this is gratifying, and, and certainly those uh, uh, folks on the webinar today who aren't certain, I would just ask you to follow up so that you know definitely whether or not this is a hole in your test security apparatus. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to close the poll, and let's move to the next slide. I think we've got John Freemer up now. Yes, and I hope you uh, hear and see consistency in what I'm going to say and what you've just heard from Mike. We're trying to work together different ways of communicating what we think would be valuable for you to do. We don't want any of you to get in the, in the pit that happened with Atlanta Public Schools. I think you need to do all of the things that I'm going to say, but you've got a lot of other things on your plate too, so you will need to prioritize. But it's not, I, I, I like to go crabbing, particularly to go out in a boat and catch blue claw crabs. And it's like, what part of the boat does, doesn't, uh, has to hold water? You know, That's the way it is with test security. You have to do everything right any weak link and, and uh, you're in trouble. All right, let's move to the first slide. Uh, I move relatively quickly through these. I, I hope they're going to be clear. Rochelle? Yeah, and John, just along that point, these slides will be made available to all attendees and we will have a recording of the full session on our website. So, sorry, John. Sure, no, do that anytime. So uh, kind of consistent with uh, other comments, you need to make sure that people are aware of security. You put it in your newsletters, communications, different types of meetings, and uh, periodically issue statements about what you're doing in your district on the issue of test security. Next slide. In a variety of ways, you, you want to have uh, everybody committing to following the rules that you care about in your district, including students. Uh, having a student honor code, I think, is good. Uh, having uh, clear statements of the expectations of staff for all parts of test development so some of those horror stories of Mike's don't occur. And emphasize how much you value honest test taking. It's their own work that you want. It's, it's teachers doing what uh, we do in our district. Next slide. You want to have it uh, be somebody's responsibility to go through all of the procedures that you are following, uh, not just for state assessments, where they tend to be fairly rigorously defined, but even what sometimes called formative assessments. Uh, they need to be looked at, because the, often they start out and they're not going to be that important, and, but it never seems to stay that way. They start acquiring uh, 
decisions linked to them, and so you need to keep security there uh, up to date and review it. We suggest annually uh, make that part of your annual prep for the testing year, not just the calendars and not conflicting with band practice and so on, but uh, making sure all the security pieces are in place. I mean, simple things like we say that we're locking up all our tests in a room, but is it still true that that room has only a, one or two keys and they're all controlled, or did we make a construction change so now it's really easy to get in there? Uh, number uh, Fourth slide, next slide. Re review your own test security training material. Often districts that are really paying attention develop some additional material to supplement what they get from the state. And in some states, you really need to go from what you get from the Department of Ed to what you're going to give to your building test coordinators for their work. Make sure you know that everyone's been trained, not just those who officially are supposed to give the test on a particular day, but whoever is going to be called on to fill in you know, because Mr. Stetter or Mr. Freeman are sick that day unexpectedly. Is the person that's going to fill in, have they been trained? And then make sure you do annual training. People somewhat inclined to say, didn't we already do this? I know how to do this. Don't, don't let that happen. Uh, make sure everybody gets it every year. Uh, next slide. I think observations are really valuable. Uh, some of them can be on a schedule. You're going to go around, make sure all of the before testing things are in place the way they're supposed to be. How would, how are booklets being handled? How they're being stored? What's the plan for getting them back and forth? If you have proctors, which is a good system, both a, a, the teacher and a proctor in every classroom, uh, make sure all those assignments are done, that you're comfortable with who is uh, allowed to be a proctor, for example, when you have it. And then do unannounced test session observations. Uh, it's all well and good to come to see to my house and see if the kitchen counter is clear and the beds are made and there's not junk all over the floor. And if you tell me you're coming, we're going to be great. You just drop in during the day, who knows what you'll find. So you, you need to do some of them unannounced. And the difference between doing only one and none is big because the word will get around that you do that. And then follow up on what you observe. It's almost uh, worse not to have looked than to look and not do anything about it. Next slide. Take advantage of the many people who are out there trying to do a good job. Uh, there are some extremely conscientious uh, uh, district test coordinator and school level test coordinators that uh, we've encountered in our Cavion work. They like to be asked about how things can be better. Some of them are super conscientious. If you ever get around to reading the Atlanta Governor's Office investigation of their schools, there was an incorruptible school test coordinator in a school with a very corrupt principal. So it was his job to take that person out away from the school so that others could go in and take out the entry sheets and erase. Just an awful situation. but. I do think that that person is really quite a hero of not giving in to a lot of corruption. And then also uh, have an anonymous tip line. People worry if we have an anonymous line, we'll get crank calls. That's not been a bit in our experience, but we find that a lot of discovery of trouble comes from a tip line. Uh, next slide. Depending on your role and background, maybe you're not the right person to study your test data carefully, but somebody needs to study it. Uh, everybody gets year-to-year uh, -year test information so you can look at gains. And if it's super unusual, never uh, been detected before gain, it's almost certainly cheating. We don't use that word much, but nobody takes a whole class from the 10th percentile to the 50th percentile. No one does that. So you, some of those results in Atlanta, I mean, how could anyone have believed that? But there are other indices, and we'll talk more about that. And uh, as you get into the, trying to do a better job, look at those other indices. Single best index is the similarity of responses from student to student, because it picks up uh, both erasures and prior exposure and helping during the test. It picks up a lot of different things. Uh, next slide. 
don't wait until you have a security incident to decide what to do about it. My dad was a New York City fireman. We had fire drills in our house. How would we get out of the house? How to break the windows. We didn't actually break the windows. But how to break the window and the storm window and lower yourself down. Think that through. Know what everybody's going to do in your district. I mean, you're going to have to tell the state pretty quickly, but exactly what information is going to be collected, by whom, and how are you going to deal with it. Do that in advance, uh, not uh, under the gun. Uh, next slide. There's a lot of good information. We mentioned these uh, these books coming out. Uh, well, the handbook is already out, the guidebook. It's actually available in electronic form, but they're trying to figure out at the Center for Chief State School Officers how to put it in uh, book form uh, so that it can be acquired. Look at our webinars, things that we do. Uh, webinars are free, the newsletter is free. Look for what others have done. Don't make what I tell my uh, grandkids now. Make new mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes as everybody else. Learn, learn from them. And then the uh, last slide, uh, this bit of advice applies if you are making your own test, because you cannot do these things for the state test. You don't have that control. But if you're making your own test, figure out ways to minimize the number of times questions appear, and do things like, if it's computer delivered, or randomize the placement of the questions and rotate the options so that you get a different question than I do, and even if you see it, it the answer is not necessarily going to be B because we, we rotate the options. So I think we're ready now to uh, to do a Here's Mike. Thanks, John. Um, I'd like to uh, use this next series of slides and comments just to expand uh, your knowledge about additional tools that often need to come into play in order for you and your district to have confidence in the test result. Um, in this regard, we're talking about the use of data forensics. This uh, is rather new in terms of uh, school-based testing. Typically, uh, when the assessment director analyzes the most recent round of student test results, the focus is on ranking individual schools or grades for largest gains, so that, that can be part of the report to the school board and the community. As the school board and the community then look at these results, and as media combs through them, uh, leaders at the district level or at the building level can be asked to explain dramatic rises in scores and also feel the pressure to scale out whatever is uh, assumed to be responsible for these gains as um, interventions for other buildings. Now, it's best to confirm these score gains are correctly attributed to improve student skills and knowledge by analyzing the results to rule out suspicious score patterns on usual erasers, if it's a paper and pencil test, or other accounted, uh, unaccounted for irregularities. The question for districts is often, how can this additional analysis be completed with the limitations of staff time and perhaps limitations on our own statistical expertise? Next slide. Data forensics as a science is, is the analysis of these student test data using very sophisticated computer programs and analytic tools to tease out uh, indicators of test fraud, collusion, and other security violations. The forensics process can assist with this analysis at multiple levels, at the state level, district, school, and then within school at the grade, classroom, and content area. Now, in accountability, high stakes exams were primarily interested in uh, reading or English language arts and mathematics, but this is also applicable to local assessments in other areas of linked to the standards or uh, areas of interest to an individual district. Next slide. If we look inside uh, data forensics, it is uh, um, composed of a number of specific uh, analyses, and one of the most prominent is, is one that we call the similarity index. Now, this is a measure of uh, similarity within test results that points to a very high likelihood that there is a uh, potential test security violation. Now, in order to gain some insight as to uh, how common a significant finding on this similarity index would be, I've put together some 
naturally occurring events for some comparison. So if we can move to the next slide. Experts tell us that the chance of being hit by lightning is one in a million. And we all know, those of us who have bought lottery tickets or gambled in some fashion, the odds are very uh, high against us, uh, on the order of one in 10 million that we might win with the lottery. The chance of a false positive DNA finding is roughly one in 30 million. Now, in Cavion's work with the similarity index and its own uh, data forensics, they set a very conservative standard for the chances of finding a significant similarity index finding, and Caveat has set it at one in one trillion, just to make sure that we're not getting any false positives in the work. So this is a, a, a very rare occurrence indeed, one that should alert you if, if forensics is being provided to your district or to your state, that there are test irregularities here that ought to be followed up with further inquiry. Next slide. In addition to Caveon's work with uh, state, uh, statewide programs, uh, we have uh, helped to build a new product that's specifically targeted toward the needs of school districts. Uh, we've labeled it the Caveon Security Screen. This is a subset of the data analytics that is typically offered to a state uh, or into a full comprehensive test security audit. And it, uh, we think, is targeted in such a way so that it gives feedback to the district team around answer copying, potential test coaching by a teacher, um, perhaps someone other than the identified student taking the test, or collusion between uh, classroom groups. Again, as I say, the test security screen is, is specifically designed for uh, many of the questions that would come at a district level. Next slide. The elements on the Caveon security screen include these. There is a forensics analysis uh, of specific tests. Uh, output would be provided in a report by subject, school, and student. There would be a data interpretive conference and online communications uh, following the, an uh, the analysis of the, of the data of the student test window and then some guidance in terms of follow-up steps that the district should consider. Uh, we offer, we think, a, a very effective consultation with this uh, product that would help you to evaluate and perhaps identify improvements in your, your test security program planning and the evaluation of potential weak points. The focus then is on how might you need to change or update policies and procedures so that you're fully protected. Next slide. Uh, this is the only scary slide in our deck today. Uh, I know how all of us feel when we're uh, confronted with tables of uh, mysterious data. Uh, we pulled this one from a, a, a sample uh, data forensics and, uh, analysis, and we've obviously changed the names of the schools. So these are all fictitious. Uh, but as you read the chart, Bookman Middle School has results reported in mathematics. There were 330 tests. 338 tests uh, taken with a pass rate of 0.43. And then as you see in the far right-hand column, you've got similarity indices um, for all of the schools in this report. There is um, a comparison within this similarity index of the number of identical right and wrong responses for clusters of students in each of these schools. The question asked with this analysis goes like this, to what extent are the number of identical responses significantly larger than what could reasonably be expected of students working independently and not helping each other. Our experience tells us that a similarity index of a value of anything larger than seven is warranted, it warrants closer inspection, it is suspect. Now in this example, a number of schools have been flagged for follow-up by the forensics analysis. Conversely, if the similarity index is very low, this can often point to clusters of highly able, high-performing students who are getting uh, large percentages of the items correct without collusion, without any interaction with each other. That appears to be the case for Midtown Middle School and McDoran High School groups that took this particular test. Let's 
move to the next slide. As we then review this, the caveat security screen, it is a combination of data forensics, including the similarity index analysis, uh, a comparison of perfect test results and identical test results across student groups, school level data reported by grade and subject, and flagged student output with cluster details that would put uh, the district superintendent and assessment director in a position to make further inquiries about potential test irregularities. The consultation that goes along with the, the data forensic service then is very helpful in terms of helping the district shape what would be best practice follow-up, where are there significant findings that need to be corroborated, and guidance in terms of next steps. We uh, should point out at this point that the Cavion security screen is specifically designed for districts, as I mentioned, and it is a subset, a very special subset of analytics that's often uh, uh, offered to state departments for statewide use. So the products are different in that regard. They, they're not substitutes for one another. That brings us to the conclusion of my comments. Uh, Steve and John, I think uh, we have some time set aside for questions if there are any. Do you want to be our MC for that, Steve? I'll happily be the MC. So as I indicated on the last poll, there is in your um, go to meeting cockpit, there is a button that you can click that will allow you to enter in a question if you have anything you'd like to ask Mike or John. <clears throat> So we'll wait and see. And nothing yet. <laughs> um, any questions? Any questions? Well, I think we're ready to move on. Good. So we wanted to uh, let people know if they had any interest in learning more about the Caveon Test Security Screen, um, that Mike Stetter is, is kind of championing, championing that service for us. And here's Mike's contact info. Again, these slides will be made available to you. Uh, if we go to the next slide, if you've not yet seen or purchased the Handbook for Test Security, um, this is a terrific, terrific resource to anyone in testing. Um, and because John was involved in editing the document, there is, we can extend a discount, you can see the link. By the way, none of the editors or authors of chapters are gaining financially from this. Um, I think any profits are being uh, shared. Well, I, John, do you know where they're going? They're going to be uh, donated to the National Council on Measurement and Education. So um, that, we're eligible for royalties, you. but we're not getting any. We've we've all signed them over to the NCME. So there is a couple of questions. Um, is there a security checklist, John, that we can share with faculty and families? Yes. Uh, we, uh, well, I should have, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike, I'm so used to answering these questions. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> oh, there ahead, is. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, there, there's actually one in that book, too, and there's another one in the, uh, the what we call the TILSA guidebook, the guidebook on data forensics. And it's, uh, I think you really need to develop your own because there's slight variations from school to school, but we can share a generic one. Great. Um, and then there's another question. It's just sort of a housekeeping question. Will this session be available for revisiting? We didn't realize that it was to be Eastern Daylight Time and there's Central Daylight Time. Um, the session, the slides will be made available to attendees. 
and we've recorded the session and barring any technical glitches, which sometimes we do experience those gremlins, but um, a recording of the session will be available on our website. So in the follow-up, we'll make sure everyone has links to that. And that way, if, if someone was unable to attend, you can just send them the link and hopefully they can gain a little bit of information that, that will prove helpful. Next slide, please. On behalf of John and Mike, we want to say thank you. We hope, we, we strive to make these sessions helpful. We, had, um, we want to share relevant, meaningful, impactful information, and, and that we, we hope we have accomplished that. If you have feedback for us, uh, we have our LinkedIn site. We've got a couple of different channels by which you can share that. Any ideas or tips for making these sessions more effective, we'd greatly appreciate. John and Mike, any last words? I know you folks are so busy these days, so thank you so much for joining us. And, and you know, write me a Twitter message or send me an email, and is, I'm going to try to answer any question I get. So. That's kind of my commitment in this field. Uh, John, I would echo the same. Please email me if you have specific questions. I'll be glad to share experience. Uh, I, I thank you for taking time out of your busy day to attend and to learn something more about uh, steps you can take. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Take care.